Okay, so um, yes, I'm I'm the other co-founder of the Religious Studies Project, Chris, and um, ideally I'll not be saying too much here because I'm surrounded by people uh, who hopefully will be saying a lot. Um, my job is to to chair, so you know if they start fighting or anything, I'll you know try and <laughs> separate them. Um, but basically, um, I'm going to welcome you all to this um, roundtable on narrative and uh, reflexivity in the academic study of religion. And what we're hoping to um, do is to follow on nicely from that interview on uh, religion and literature, which is one particular type of narrative, um, and also covers a variety of um, issues related to ethnography, autoethnography, the writing of the scholar into the text, and things like that. Um, but before we go any further, it'd be helpful for everyone to introduce themselves. I know most of you um, in this room here at the University of Chester will know everyone, but uh, we've got Don Llewellyn, Don Llewellyn, Alana Vincent, Elaine Graham, Wendy Dossett, and Ethan Quillen. So if I could just go around in that order and you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, then we'll get started. Okay. Um, so I, I'm at the University of Chester. I, I teach Christian studies, but my research interests are gender and contemporary Christianity. But my PhD was uh, women's spiritual reading practices. So my interest in narrativity and reflexivity come from that kind of use of interviews and ethnography to kind of capture the experiences of women and their reading practices. Okay, thanks, Don. Alana? Um, I do... Jewish studies, but my particular interest is in religion and the arts and religion and literature. So I work with narrative and literature kind of on a daily basis. <laughs> Elaine? I'm Elaine Graham. I'm professor of practical theology here at Chester. I guess I have two main interests for the purposes of this afternoon. The first one is that I too am a secret science fiction fan <laughs> and very interested in the way science fiction narratives and religious narratives function, particularly in the construction of boundaries and the post-human and all that sort of thing. Secondly, um, I'm programme leader for our professional doctorate in practical theology here, where the emphasis on practice-based research on the reflective practitioner clearly introduces all sorts of issues about the conventions by which the researcher writes themselves into their research. Thank you. Wendy? Hello, everybody. I'm Wendy Dossett. I'm lecturer in religious studies at the department here at Chester. Um, my career kind of started off um, in, in Buddhist studies, actually. Um, I did a fair bit of participant observation um, in temple situations in Japan. Um, uh, but over time, my, my interests um, have changed, and I'm currently undertaking um, a, a research project amongst a, a community of people who are describe themselves as in recovery from addiction. So people who are in 12-step um, fellowships such as Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous. Um, and those fellowships are very much communities of storytelling where um, people are um, looking back at their lives um, and trying to understand what's happened to them um, and trying to um, account for um, the change that has occurred. So these people are now long, no longer using um, drink or drugs or other destructive behaviours. So that's that's a huge transformation. Um, and I'm interested in the role of, of narrative in that process. Wonderful. And Ethan. Uh, hi, my name is Ethan Quillen. I'm uh, finishing my PhD at University of Edinburgh. Uh, my main focus is on uh, atheism. And my uh, sort of take on this is reading fictional texts as if they are ethnography the possibilities and ramifications of doing that. Um, when you read a fictional text that is realist and told from a first-person perspective, and you read that as if it's real, what does that make that text, what does it turn into, and then what does that mean about uh, actual ethnography that is conducted through uh, participant observation and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, my interests on atheism are uh, sort of discursive examples of atheism, so fiction and artwork, um, how they're created, what they mean, and then how people use them. So. Fantastic. So. Um, all eminently more qualified than me to be participating in this roundtable discussion, hence I will try and keep my chatter to a minimum. Um, but first off then, narrative. We've been bandying around this word narrative. Does anyone want to, to kick us off with problematizing that term? And what, what are we talking about when we're talking about narrative? Maybe it's different in all of your work. Um, 
Dawn. I was told I had to start off on this. Um, <laughs> you, you, you got us into this mess. <laughs> I did. It's just that I'm the whole reason we're here. For, for me, n narrative is, in some ways, not a very complicated term. It means stories. It's the stories we tell. It's the stories we read. I, I think it's useful to think of narrative as a... It's almost a structuring uh, kind of mechanism as well. It's a way in which we can order our lives. It's a way in which we can make meaning, I think. So... Um, it's, yeah, I, I mean, narrative, it, and if you're thinking kind of more social science -y or more methodologically about narrative as an approach to research, it does include some of the things we've talked about. It does include kind of autoethnography. It includes, I think, ethnography, actually. Um, as the researcher, you go and you listen to people's stories and you make sense of them and you narrate them and you kind of structure them in that way, in a way that makes sense for, for you as the researcher and our academic community and hopefully to the community you're researching. So I think it can include... Biography, autobiography, action research, um, autoethnography, and for all those things, you need reflexivity, I think. So that's kind of how I think of narrative. I don't know if people have a different view. Perfect. Wendy? Not a different view, but um, just in terms of the importance of narrative being, um, you know, issuing from individuals. I mean, obviously, there are community corporate narratives as well, but when you're focusing on the, the narrative of an individual, you've got a way of accessing the ways in which they are interacting with ver the various authorities within the, the system that they're, they're engaged. So if you're, if, you know, if you're talking to somebody in a religious community, um, you're finding out their kind of personal position in relation to what might seem to be authoritative statements about what they should be doing or should be believing. Um, so you kind of uncover um, whether they're using a filtering mechanism to um, approach the, 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 the texts that they're using or um, you know, whether some authorities are more important than others for them. So you get a much more nuanced picture um, of what's going on. And I like it because it's, it's a kind of a more bottom-up approach um, than, you know, say the, the world religions paradigm where you're kind of trying to, you're asking, you know, what are the, what are the texts, what are the doctrines, you know, what are the rituals? Um, you know, it, it's that kind of emphasis on personal experience and, you know, and the stories of people's lives. Mm. I mean, my immediate reaction to that would be, is the world religions paradigm also a narrative that's, that yes. scholars have been yeah, yeah. telling over the years? Um, yeah. Sorry, Elaine, were you? Yeah. Um, I, I think an important aspect of collective story within the study of religion would be, um, you know, precisely to move away from from text based mm -hmm. and think about performative. You know, mm -hmm. so so ritual mm -hmm. um, would be a way of enacting a story. And I think for a lot of people in the study of religion, the way in which personal story interacts with communal story. Mm -hmm. A bit too simplistic to say there's my story, our stories, and the story. Um, and clearly, I think a number of us would want to contest the idea there is the story. No, yeah. but nevertheless, mm -hmm. it precisely raises that issue um, of, of authority, Wendy. Mm -hmm. you know, how are people reworking mm -hmm. the stories uh, in which they find meaning that shape mm -hmm. them? Um, and very often, I think the performance of a story or narrative would be different from the official one. And that's mm -hmm. where that tension maybe rests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so to me, it sounds like narratives are a fairly broad term. Um, I, I wonder, Ethan, you might have a, a comment here. I know that in your current research, you're bandying around the um, Twitter hashtag, everything is fiction. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, w w with narratives being so broad and with everything potentially being a narrative, whether it's a, you know, a performance or um, the scientific data that you know, someone gathers in a lab, it, it's told in a narrative and it's been produced due to some societal narrative. Like, where do we draw the line? How do we, how, how do we decide what is a narrative study and what isn't? Um, I'm glad you brought up the uh, everything is fiction. That's nice. It's, that's good. Um, that's actually the title of my thesis um, in the idea that everything is fiction and fiction means, for, for my use, fiction means two specific things. It means story and it means stories that are constructed. Um, so in the idea that if something is real or something is fake or if something is false or fiction, um, the, the difference or the, the lines we draw there, I think, are, are based on how we use fictions, how we construct fictions, and what they mean sort of in our, sort of our constructions of identity, essentially. Um, for narrative, I think that plays a, a, an important part ethnographically um, in how we research 
the stories that people use or they write or they tell. Um, I like uh, Wendy's example of um, the sort of uh, Narcotics Anonymous, is that there, there's, these are stories that are, people are using not only to identify themselves in a certain way, but are constructing an identity that they're trying to separate from, or at least acknowledging that's what they were, and sort of moving away from that. So I like that idea as, as narrative. Um, as far as drawing the lines, um, I like to, to sort of be contrarian on many occasions, and, and, and I did this on Twitter just now a few minutes ago. On, if, we, if we read a, a fictional text like it's an ethnography, thank you, David. Um, <laughs> if you read it like it's ethnography, we have to draw a line of, uh, inevitably there's a line that's drawn. And I think, um, I think you said something about uh, uh, something that, 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 that fictions can be sacred texts. Yeah. And I, I sort of was trying to be contrarian back to say, what's the difference between then the, the revelation to John and the Da Vinci Code? You know, there, there's inevitably going to be a line that's drawn there. And I know that there are two different texts, but they're also texts. They're also fictions in the sense that they're constructed. One, one of these fictions people will, certain individuals will take to be real in fact, and others will say, well, that's just part of the gospel, if you get my joke there. I was going to say... Although you might be surprised about which is which. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at least um, knowing the number of relations who have sent me copies of Dan Brown saying, you should study this. <laughs> <laughs> the truth has been hidden from you. <laughs> um, but yeah, we can flip that question on its head. You know, what happens if we read fictions as though they're ethnographies. What happens if we read ethnographies as though they're fictions? Or you know, ethnographies written like fictions. Well, yeah, you know, like with the, well, precisely with attention to you know those questions of authorship and what form has been imposed on because any, I, even the worst stylist and academics can be really really bad stylists, is still a stylist. You know, we still frame what we're saying, we still pay some attention to the order in which our words go on the page and how they're going to sound mm -hmm. when they're read out. There is no pure, unfiltered you know, spew of, this is just what happened. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, the minute you start writing, you are constructing. Yeah, I, was, I guess when I kind of asked that question, um, as we do as academics, I was thinking about my own work. Um, and um, <laughs> so when I kind of asked women about what literature supported their spiritual journeys, it was a very broad kind of range of, of, of texts and for them. So I would kind of think about the users of literature. So that kind of distinction, I'm not making that distinction between kind of what counts as a sacred text. You know, if we kind of turn it over ethnographically and qualitatively to a community, what counts for them as a sacred text? Yeah, they say that it is, but who are yeah. we to say that they're... And that's how the yeah. kind of the history of the canon kind of came about anyway. That's how the Testament and the Gospels came about. What, what communities, what texts were communities using? Yeah. So I think that's a really interesting question. So, and of course that changes and it's in, in flux because the kind of fictive, non-fictive, what's true, what's not, it's w whether we're researchers listening to those narratives, those narratives of representations that need interpreting and their interpretations that are representing things. So that's, uh, yeah, I, th I think the, the non-fictive, fictive question's really not helpful in that, divide in, in that way, but that's it's what I'd ask. Yeah, it's fun <laughs> to ask, but in that kind of, can literature be sacred text? I'd kind of have to say, Yes, to the for the people yeah, that it is for. Yeah, it's you need to. On, yeah. I'm glad you brought up um, interpretation because um, we we've sort of mentioned autoethnography or when ethnography is written like fiction, and there's that sort of post literary turn, or it's not really post. It sort of happens sometime around the 50s and the 60s when Malinowski's diary is published, and everyone says, "Oh, he was crazy, and he hated the things he was doing." So now we can all be reflective, um, but it kind of goes back to the the prior, the pre Malinowski stage where, you know, ethnographies are being built or constructed based on you know, what we might now consider biased or opinionated or, you know, people basically traveling and writing things down. And you have the armchair ethnologists who are writing, you know, factual-based uh, descriptions. But the idea of interpretation and even, even the, the sort of functionist Malinowski style where you have a holistic description or an interpretation is still a construction. You know, even if it's completely objective and the, the author is um, vacant, the, the, he's, there's a specific term, the author absent sort of, text, it's still a construction. It's still an interpretation of an individual who is basically saying, 
I've gone to this place and I've, I've written down their culture and here it is in its perfect form. Mm -hmm. Now learn about it. Yeah. And th where's the difference between that and you know, a, a Laura Bohannon who's writing about herself and her experiences as she's doing it, but that seems, you know, that's, that's wrong. It's too subjective. It's, it's broken the rules, the carnal rule that you have to be, it's all still interpretations, yeah. so no matter what. Yeah. We seem to be heading um, in a kind of pragmatic functionalist direction, and I'm not entirely unhappy with that, but I just want to check that out, that, you know, we're saying, well, narrative functions to create religious identity, other kinds of cultural identity. Uh, you know, we shouldn't be asking about meaning as truth, but meaning in the way that it, it shapes the fabric of our of, of the way we inhabit the world. Um, and that the most important thing really is, is to be transparent and to, uh, as, as in my terms I said before, the, the researcher or the, the author or the subject is, is writing themselves in. So they, they recognize and acknowledge the extent to which they participate in the creation of their own knowledge, which is another term for reflexivity. Mm -hmm. So to kind of check that out with everybody and see whether I'm kind of reflecting back in the way that is helpful. Yeah. Yes. Well, a resounding yes there, <laughs> Wendy. Yes, a resounding yes. Um, but also, you know, w when, you're, when you're producing um, this kind of research, you're also thinking about who's going to be consuming it. <laughs> you know, who are you writing for? So it's, it's not just writing yourself in. You're, you're kind of engaged in an act of translation, which, you know, carries with it its own rules, depending on what, what precisely it is you're trying to achieve. You know, if you're trying to perhaps correct a, a misunderstanding, you know, are you... You need to be kind of open that that's you know that's what you're doing. You know if you're if you're trying to engage with um, another discipline, um, which you know I I often find that you know I'm 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 engaging with um, disciplines that that have um, very explicit um, secular agendas um, and and they they. Uh, but you know I have to do some translation work really to. Um, <laughs> to explain my research site in the terms that, m that the people I'm researching um, speak of it themselves. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm very much present in that and the way I'm interpreting all of those things, my, reser my research site and the people receiving my reser research are, you know, all part of that construction. I'm just going to pass over to Elaine, but I should mention that we will be taking questions from the floor um, towards the end as well, just so you can be thinking of those whilst we're going on. Well, let me raise another question in response to Wendy, which is the, the ethical dimensions of narrative mm -hmm. and uh, pick up a, a word you used, Dawn, about representation. I think that's a fabulous word, you know, uh, both in terms of presenting something, portraying something, but more importantly, that political dimension, you know, political representative stands in for another mm -hmm. and certainly in forms of action research mm -hmm where uh, you know, the researcher's agenda uh, and hopefully those of her, of her collaborators is again absolutely to the forefront. This is knowledge that will facilitate change um, and, and that's clear. And yet clearly if you are setting yourself up as the representative, the spokesperson, mm -hmm. the one who tells the story, mm -hmm. perhaps on behalf of those who have never heard their voice yes. and we're into all that stuff about, you know, if, if we uh, allow our voices to be heard and <coughs> subaltern voice, a submerged voice, that's very important. But carrying huge issues of who speaks for whom in that mm. respect and who constructs a narrative for what ends. Yeah. So I'll just throw that one in. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, <coughs> my, my immediate reaction when I, when I start uh, hearing about, you know, you're speaking for the, 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 those who don't get spoken for is that you're sort of in, in getting involved in the societal discourses on, you know, you're getting involved in the hegemonic power structures by saying, we'll legitimize your subaltern position by focusing on it. it is, yeah. <laughs> you're already involved Absolutely. in that power structure yeah. yep. you know there, there is something to be said for owning that and attempting to use your power for good um, not that that's yeah. itself an unproblematic mm. Mm. position somebody take this away from me <laughs> <laughs> um, just uh, to, to, to take things maybe in a slightly different direction, but I use the word discourse there and uh, um, I, know, I know that I myself and a number of my colleagues place ourselves in the discursive study of religion and I'm, I'm, 
from a lot of what I'm hearing about narratives, I'm struggling in a way to try and work out what the difference is between studying narratives and studying discourses. I wonder if anyone wants to take that on or uh, has any thoughts on that? How can we stop by telling us what you mean yeah. by discourse? Yeah. <laughs> language use. Yeah, effectively. Yeah. Yeah. The ways in which um, people use language and construct things, um, but also you know, discourses themselves are, are pervasive and can take on a life of their own and can be invoked implicitly and explicitly. And You also have to look at what you mean by text as well. Sorry, that's all I had to say. Um, what do you mean by text? That, that if it's language use, what do you mean by text? Is it, is, it, is it written text? Is it spoken text? Do you have to sort of uh, adjust what you mean by you know, textuality? Hmm. Are narratives always just texts? Yeah. <laughs> I guess when I was just thinking about that, I was thinking when, when I mean narrative, I mean that kind of capturing you know, the individual experiences of a of a community or and those members of that community or you know or in, or individuals so I, I can I kind of mean it like that when I'm thinking about my when I'm thinking about qualitative work when I when I kind of think of the word discourse I, I do think of a kind of I kind of wonder which is the overarching term I guess I was trying to kind of think well do discourses belong to narratives do narratives belong to discourses when I think of discourse I think a little bit more about an ideology per, perhaps or a uh, kind of wider so societal kind of structure culture um, and and it's, it's not that narratives are narratives are particular they do have that kind of as Wendy was talking about they're a kind of way of opening up the particular but I, I guess I think more ideologically about mm. discourse and a narrative not so much and I would I know discourse is an approach to research as well, mm. but I, you know, when I think about narrative as a methodological approach, it, I don't think of it in the kind of Foucauldian discoursey kind of way. I guess that yep. does that does that reflect what you were thinking? Is that why you were kind of confused about the two? Or yep, um, I'm, I'm probably still confused <laughs> about the two. Sorry, I've got another mic on me, so oh, it's yeah. fine. But yeah, I, I would I would still talk about you know dominant societal narratives yeah. as. Yeah. Discourses, yeah. you know, so there's that. Yeah, they might yeah. be interchangeable, yeah. but yeah. when you're embarking on narrative research, I'm thinking about particular oh, tools and techniques that, that 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 kind of go along with that, like the auto ethnography or the autobiographical or the ethnography. Mm. Yeah, because so I, I would definitely use them interchangeably. Um, in my own research, I use them interchangeably, but I do talk about uh, narratives as part of discourse um, because discourse for me is just it's a it's a useful methodology um, in the sense that you can, you can sort of draw lines around or put up a border around what you're talking about. Um, so when I'm looking at uh, discursive examples or fields of discourse on atheism, it sort of just gives you uh, specifics on what you're talking about. So if you're going to talk about uh, the discursive field of atheism that is based in fictional texts, you can say, well, I'm going to use this novel by Ian McEwan, and that's the, the sort of discursive example I'm going to use. It's also, it's a narrative in itself, and it, it's talking about narratives, but I think I just, I use the, the term discourse more than narrative just because I think it's a practical, it, it just mm. works a little easier. Okay, maybe we'll, we'll leave that there. Um, I'm thinking we can maybe proceed on to more talking about the, the ethnography, autoethnography, reflexivity question, which is very much related. But just before <laughs> I leave that, did anyone have a, a burning point um, that they wanted to raise for discussion on, on narrative in particular? OK. So ethnography, autoethnography, reflexivity. Um, I guess, again, my stereotypical view of sort of autoethnography, reflexivity, etc., is, is that well, isn't that just what, what we're all doing now? We're, 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 you know, every time we write something, we're always so conscious of what are my presuppositions? Let's write them down. What is my agenda? What good am I doing with this? You know, so, so what, what's specific about this? That, that's not just what, what we're all doing. Or are we not all doing it? It's, a, it's <laughs> a really, yeah, it's a really good question. So I think... The difference between that kind of my name's Dawn and I'm white and I'm middle class and I'm, you know, heterosexual and I'm a lecturer at a university kind of naming all the intersections of identity in that way. Mm. We, we do try and do that with our research and it's important to kind of locate ourselves in, in mm. that way. But reflexivity pushes that a bit a bit further. 
and autoethnography probably pushes that even even further. Um, so with reflexivity, we're using that social location as a kind of critical lens to turn back on the way in which we've gone about our research and the way we've generated the research and the impact that has on the research that we're doing with the communities and individuals that we're doing. So it's not kind of just reflection. Reflection is that maybe evaluative thinking, you know, all that worked well, all that didn't work well, whereas reflexivity brings that personal element into it. And then with the autoethnography, you become a site of research yourself with that reflexivity and we kind of I think there's a there's a bit of a tendency which a lot of people have been critical of to do that kind of you know like that listing of all our of all our identities and to kind of leave it there they often start a book or they finish a book and they might appear kind of halfway through an article or something but but it's it's not it, that's kind of not what reflexivity is or what autoethnography is you know autoethnography tries to write that through the whole the whole process I think I think that would be one way of kind of making a distinction between mm. those things. I wonder if it's almost like layers of an onion. You, know, you peel these different things away. As you say, you make the declaration of where you stand, and that's important. But it seems to me is uh, quite right that you know, it's, it's then the question, well, what, what am I doing with that standpoint? What difference does that make? Through to the business of actually making that standpoint pr and the problematization of that standpoint the, the research mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. um, and turning back the lens of scrutiny into the, again, the process by which knowledge is made. Ethan. Um, I think, the, I think uh, Ellis even refers to autoethnography as, as an onion. I think, she, oh, yeah. I think at one point she does mention oh, I can't that. can't claim it as original. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it, just, well, it's, yeah, it, shows, it shows I've read her. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Do apologies. You just sort of pinged. Um, I, for my own, okay, it's all about you know, my work, but um, I... I like to, to sort of locate the meaning of reflexivity or autoethnography in literary style, literary writing. Um, I think, you know, when Clifford, Marcus, and Geard sort of tipped the apple cart and started to talk about when you do anthropology, it's all about writing. It's not about, it isn't just about going out and, and observing and doing field work. It's, it's about writing it down. Um, and that sort of focus on the literary had... Uh, major ramifications to what we mean when we say we're doing anthropology or we're, we're writing ethnography, um, specifically in how we go about constructing that text. And you can see the, the sort of progression where ethnographies start to be written in a certain literary way, a certain literary style, and the author then becomes a part of it. You become an author yourself. Um, so with reflexivity, it, it isn't just about um, revealing the process. It's also about the, the style of the writing itself, that when you, you're sort of acknowledging that, yes, this is what we do, but I'm now going to talk about I'm doing it, rather than I'm going to be this omniscient voice, this sort of this godlike figure that is there and telling you what this culture means. Here I am actually doing it, and this is what the process. The problem with that, of course, is, and with what I'm doing in my thesis, is that you start to go along this progression to the point that you can find a realist novel that is completely made up, that is completely imagined, by an individual who might be skilled in recreating an identity um, in words on the page, but that still means it isn't completely made up. And we can sort of, we start to get a little, we, we veer a little too dangerously into creativity, into being more imaginative rather than constructing something that is made from, things are now made up. Um, and so with, with mine, I'm, I'm reading Ian McEwan, but the two texts I've chosen, they're first person narratives and I've removed Ian McEwan entirely. And you read the text as if they're written by the characters who wrote them. And what happens when you do that and you've written out the fact that, hey, this is a fiction written by an Englishman who lives in England or in London and he's writing this book about these characters, that the characters are now real. They're now representatives of a sort of a holistic identity. And it can be sort of dangerous. I love it. And it's interesting, <laughs> over lunch I was poking at Facebook, as one does on one's lunch break, and someone had sent around a link to um, Harry Potter and the School of Prayer and Miracles, which is ostensibly a fundamentalist Christian rewriting of Harry Potter so that they, this woman's children can read it and not be contaminated by witchcraft. It's completely over the top. It is almost certainly a spoof on fundamentalist Christian critiques yeah, of Harry a, Potter. A term for it. I completely forget what it's called. Yeah. But, um, yeah. 
and, and the argument that I was starting to have, and then I came here to talk about fiction and <laughs> literature and religious studies instead of, you know, was it, yeah, but actually this is speaking very plausibly into that debate, you know, and there was that word that I hesitated as I was typing it, you know, plausible, mm. um, because it, I think there is a difference in how we receive that text, you know, whether it is in fact written by a stay-at-home mom somewhere in mm. Texas or Utah, you know, or whether it's written by someone who is aping that voice. Mm. You know, and yet, my first instinct is still that it is telling us something about the way that you know, this push and pull between this particular inflection of religion and the wider cultural milieu in which it's situated is working. Um, I'm tossing that one out there. And, and, and there is a kind of longer tradition of... of, of of doing that well, your mm. kind of, you know, kind of slight worry about it. So when I think about Zora Neale Hurston's work and her ethnography, autobiography, she's an anthropologist, but she's writing about gender, race and class and telling those stories so powerfully and so beautifully. And, and I was thinking also kind of Christine Bold, who's written on narrative ap approaches. She talks uh, in her work, what she did was, is she kind of almost wrote vignettes uh, from, the, from the students she was working with. So she interviewed them and you can see the interview transcript. You can see her summary of the interview transcript. And then you, she lets you kind of see how she's woven those, those together. Very much in the way that kind of Ellis, like Karen and Ellis does it as well. Um, um, the thrice told tale as well. It, Exactly. So this, it has a, we kind of think it might be some newfangled kind of notion, postmodern term, but it, it has a, it does have a kind of longer tradition, which is just as, you know, I would say questions of validity and reliability um, are, are fairly secure, I, I, I think, actually, you know, I, 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 I do. I don't know. Maybe it's just me and a romanticised notion about, you know. Until someone comes along and then starts writing about fictions as ethnography, so I guess that's, you know. Nicholas Lee is starting to compare poetry with ethnography, actually, at the moment. Yeah. She kind of likens poetry to, to ethnography and the fact that there's a you're trying to capture a voice, you're trying to capture an essence and, uh, you know, of what's going on. And sh it's, it's the listening and the writing that she kind of compares it to. It's lovely. There's an ethnographer, I'm not going to remember his name, but he's a uh, uh, New Zealander, and he does the same thing. He writes poetry as he's doing his fieldwork, and the poetry is about the fieldwork itself, and he publishes them separately as fictions to his ethnography. I'm not going to remember his name, and I feel sort of embarrassed about that. Um, we're not going to finished there, but I just want to make sure that we do get to open up to the floor a little bit, because there's uh, 15 minutes left, so maybe if we could have 10 minutes of questions from the floor, and then maybe five minutes of, of uh, summing up. And also, we've been talking a lot about reflexivity, autoethnography, narrative, but not particularly rooted in the study of religion, so maybe if people can try and think about that in their, in their questions. Um, but I wonder, does anyone in the room have something that would like to kick us off with um, in terms of a question. And David, maybe you can run around with the mic. Yes, I have a, a question or comment about, you know, the issue of identity and uh, the identity of the research. And obviously, there was the argument, so it's just a list, you know, we take certain points or, you know, Elaine used the, the analogy of the onion, you know, has different layers. But I wonder whether it's actually a bit more complicated that identities are more like, um, again, I don't want to sort of do a competition of analogies and, you know, <laughs> but, you know, a kaleidoscope or like a carousel. I mean, Ooh. it's more the way, I mean, our identities it depends on how, what is perceived of us and obviously what we present. And obviously when we do ethnographic research, we very often create narratives around ourselves mm -hmm. strategically mm -hmm. in order to establish a report. So we invent an image of ourselves in order to reach our communities and obviously establish a report and hope they will help and give us information we're looking for. Um, so again, I think there's a sort of element of narrative created while doing ethnographic research. And obviously certain things you can't change, you know, I'm a white male European, it's obvious, but when you obviously speak a different language, you adopt the cultural norms and mannerisms of a different culture, you participate in rituals that, you know, most white male Europeans would not participate in, you're obviously adopting, at least for a moment, a different identity. So I just was wondering whether, you know, any ideas on you know, the kind of the narrative construction of one's own identity while conducting uh, fieldwork. Wonderful. 
Thank you. Uh, sorry, could you just say who, who you were for uh, so, the benefit? Uh, of the... Yeah, my, my name is Oliver Sharp, but I'm professor of Islamic studies here. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so who wants to, to feel that response? I'll give it a go, shall I? Yeah. Wendy, I'll give it a go. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yes, I mean, I'm, my, my research site requires um, me to gain the trust of my participants, um, some of whom are um, potentially quite vulnerable, um, some of whom are not very literate, um, some of whom are intimidated um, that I've got a doctor in front of my name and that I come from a university. Um, so um, I, I sometimes find myself, um, you know, using um you know not not my natural language language if you like um certainly using the the terminology um to talk about experience that they would use um you know that i've i've gathered in in my field work um you know using the the kind of categories the um the particular ways of speaking um that this that this community um community has um, and that, that's, you know, that's part of the translation work that I kind of see myself doing, really. Um, but certainly there's a, there's a, yeah, a, a kind of discomfort in that, in that I'm doing that in order to um, gain their trust so that they will tell me what I want to know about them. There was a deception. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, I'm very conscious, you know, a lot of my my kind of reflexivity is is around my my kind of position of power um in in that kind of dynamic um but yes you're right that that's that's a, a constructive process in itself from, from my perspective anyway anyone anything to add mm -hmm. elaine um it Thanks. would be intriguing to to sort of add that into the whole debate in religious studies about the insider outsider mm -hmm. and the extent to which that is actually dependent on development of particular kinds of narratives which position you in particular ways mm -hmm. again strategically deliberately Absolutely. and Don. and just the fact that we move between those insider outside positions all the time so we were talking about this in our ma class actually weren't we uh, yesterday with our, our ma method students it's you know to think that i might have rapport with someone who's exactly the same age kind of class race background as, as me doesn't always kind of cut it and 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 yeah, I might be an outsider on the surface, but there might be one moment of connection that kind of makes me an insider. So we actually are in flux, though, but it's reflexivity, I think, that allows us to be aware of that and the, or at least force, it's a tool to help us be aware of that, which forces us then to be critical of the ways in which that affects and impacts upon all the religious communities that we're working with. Absolutely. And of course, we wouldn't want to flip it you can flip it around and say you wouldn't want to assume that the insider that you're talking to is always speaking to you as an insider you know it's not as if they're 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 100 a muslim all the time you know it's like who what are they speaking to you as at that particular moment um and definitely time for another question from the floor so mark garden uh, visiting lecturer here uh, we've been hearing a lot about stories as things told and constructed, and though with standpoints that also in, and I wonder about the point part of listening to the stories that are made and given to us, listening, reading, attending to them, and how that affects the scholarship of religious studies, mm -hmm. theology, the the crafting of what you listen to. Uh, anyone have any thoughts on that? Mm. <laughs> yeah, and, and almost, Mark, that gets us into questions of, of research design and methodology and then back into ethics. You know, how do you actually facilitate, if you're doing qualitative research, or like one of our DPROF students working with uh, young people in a school about their kind of spiritual life and, and their, their journeys, um, you know, what kinds of methods of, of getting at that experience um, not necessarily interviews, not necessarily the official tape recorder, 
uh, but maybe workshops in other ways, um, pictorial representations. I'm hoping Steve's going to say something now. Um, so, you know, an issue of, well, what's fit for purpose in terms of, of, of doing that? And once again, the responsibility of, of generating those voices and hearing them. But also there's a lot of romanticism, I think. You know, oh, if only the voices of the oppressed would be heard, they will be liberated, you know, uh, which is, is, well, problematic in all sorts of ways, I think. So, again, the questions of responsible knowing and, and developing ways in which um, people's lives and voices can see the light of day uh, but you still have that responsibility of, of then being the representative of that or the, or the catalyst of that. Mm -hmm. But it's not spontaneous. Mm -hmm. And a, a reaction I have to that is that it, it's this constant tension of uh, is there a, a real represent, a, a real truth that we're, we're getting at through all these different narratives mm -hmm. or, or, you know, or are they all just constructions? So it's always that tension of are we, are we looking to find something more authentic you know, what, what makes one narrative more authentic than another, etc. There, there is a tendency to think of construction as perhaps a little negatively. You mm. know, it's, it's a construction or it's a bit made up or it, it doesn't kind of count. But, they, you know, it's go, it goes back to that point. And I think it's Angela McRobbie that, that makes the point about when you're listening to the voices, you know, people are are representing their narratives when you're interviewing them or talking to them about their religious lives. And there's an exchange that happens where the researcher is, you know, the onus is on us to listen to that properly and to interpret it as, you know, as reflexively and as, and as, as fairly as we, as we can. Um, so it goes back to that interpretations and representations, those narratives that we hear. It's not, construction isn't a bad thing. It doesn't mean it's not, it's not going back to your point, it doesn't mean it's not true. <laughs> but it's still fiction, though. I think that's what I think that's what you're trying to say, Chris. Is that everything is fiction? So. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I'm just going to I'm just going to drop the mic. <laughs> yes, this is Suzanne Owen, um, religious studies lecturer here in Chester. Um, I'm actually thinking about um, authority. I'm not sure how much that was mentioned, and about how all these narratives and um, uh, discourses are actually, when spoken, are or written down authenticate or validate um, particular people or views and power relations. But even for the audience as well, if you're telling a story to someone, you couch the terms in a way that you think that person is going to want to hear it. Mm -hmm. So you might put in religious language to a religious studies lecture, but if you're speaking to an anthropologist, you might sort of play that down. So it's, uh, it's this whole sort of power th issues. I'm wondering how much it, that you uh, look into that. Um, when looking at narratives? I think that has been really strongly implicit in everything we've been talking about, about the responsibility of the researcher, about reflexivity, about you know, appropriate listening. Shaping the words to fit the audience in that... You know, that process of construction is always implicated you know, in that set of ethical considerations, you know, and the emphasis on every narrative as constructed, it keeps that concern, hopefully, you know, front and center. Does that make sense? Does that? Hmm. This might be the last word. So. Yeah. Oh. You're not allowed to finish with everything is fiction. Yeah. We're done. Um, no, but I think uh, to sort of uh, amend your question a little bit um, about fictions, um, actual novels, and, and uh, the sort of opposite of ethnography. Um, when it comes to authority or authenticity, um, does a fiction itself have authority or authenticity? Um, if we're going to say that in, in, in ethnography that is created in an objective manner of a recreation or an interpretation of a cultural identity, um, in words on the page, if, if this is decidedly authentic or authoritative, does that mean that when we read fictions to discuss religion or religious identity or as discursive fields or examples, are those any less authentic or authoritative? Is there a difference there? It just makes me think of the, the use of literature in, in feminist theology and in religious feminism. So 
when a kind of community or group of people is kind of left with a text that's, that's really problematic uh, for, for women in the way that some sacred texts have been within certain religious traditions, then there, you know, it, feminist theology has kind of sought sacred texts in other places, in other, in other ways that, that feel more authentic or appear more authentic or perceived to be more authentic than the perhaps traditional text of, the, of that particular religion. So I guess that's kind of when you, when you prompt that, I guess that's kind of where I would kind of think. Examples of communities which are doing exactly what you say, turning to fiction, because what's existing isn't kind of doing what it needs to do in terms of authentication and validation and uh, religious expression or religious and sacred import. I would say you know, authenticity and authority are not inherent properties mm -hmm. of a text. They are relationships that readers and a reading community have with that text. Yeah. You know. Well, we're talking about the text here, and both of your answers are, are, are interesting, but we, we <laughs> sort of, I want to say, <laughs> but in the idea that, that you can say that a text is authoritative and, and there's not this sort of implicit authority in it, but that's still, I think we're ignoring the fact that there's an author involved, that these are written by somebody. And I think, I know it's, it's sort of passe to consider that, that there's, there's intention involved. There's authorial intention. Mm -hmm. And does an author make a text authoritative or authentic? Or, on, authentic, or is it the text that's authentic or authoritative? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, quickly, 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 quickly. So Lynn Pierce, who's a literary theorist, um, she has this lovely notion that meaning is not just as we kind of have been thought to think between the reader and the text, but between... Te the reader and textual others, and the textual other might well be the author. It's whatever that kind of point of connection is where meaning can be found. So kind of getting out of that almost holy trinity of is the author in the text, is the meaning in the text, the author, you know, or the text, author, reader, yeah. thank you. Um, it's probably a kind of composite of, of all three, perhaps, to think about reading in that way. So we're, we're clearly clearly getting to a, a point where we could keep going on for a long time. I'm going to have to end things there, but just to say I hope you've enjoyed co-creating this narrative uh, throughout this uh, session. And just, yeah, we're all, every one of you. Um, but thanks very much to Chester for having us, and thanks to you for, for listening uh, patiently. And uh, yeah, wonderful. Thank you.